any of the folk who were at the, the, this event last year, you'll remember me. Um, and in some ways, what I'm going to be doing now is a bit of an update on what happened last year. Um, I'm interested in demonstrating the value of good design, essentially. And I'm interested in using architecture research to develop an evidence base for the value of good design. But more and more, I'm starting to think and hearing and conversations with people in this room today that we've, um, we really have a problem around the whole issue of innovation in the construction industry. This has been identified in the Construction 2025 report, in the off-site construction report, that really we need to be getting together more to, to work in an interdisciplinary way to make our industry more effective, should we say. Um, so one of my motivating challenges is, it came to me via Igloo Carillion. We, they say, we need evidence that we can take back to our hedge fund managers to show them that it's worthwhile funding ethical and sustainable uh, development in housing. So this is a long-term challenge that we, we're trying to live up to. So I'm just very briefly going to talk about demonstrating the value of good housing architects. Um, so a little bit, the first thing will be a little bit of an update on the cultural value of architecture project. That's what I talked about last time I was here. Some of the evidence we found and, and some things that came out of it. And the next thing I'm going to uh, do a kind of call for arms. Please, 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 we've got to work together and do research. We've got to take advantage of the 800 billion euros of Horizon 2020 research funding that's out there uh, for the picking. Right, so first thing, cultural value of architecture. Um, so this was an AHRC, Arts and Humanities Research Council funded project that we did here. And it began with a session here, a kind of post-it note session. Don't worry, I won't make you do any work this time um, last year. And on one door, where all the post-it notes, I asked people, do you think that good design makes a difference in your housing? And everybody except one said unequivocally, yes. And the word pride came up a lot. Um, a lot of people said good design brings out a sense of pride. And as we know, pride leads to a sense of place attachment, which leads to well-being, which leads to health. <coughs> so there's a chain of proof going through all the literature. And then the other door, I asked people, do you have any evidence that good design makes a difference? And there was nothing. Nobody had any evidence to speak of that they could say in any unequivocal way that they could do business with a policymaker uh, or anything like that. They didn't just didn't have any evidence. So there was a real lack of... Uh, there's a real feeling that the people in the room couldn't go to their funding people and say, yes, 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 we need good design, with any kind of evidence base that might be in any way faintly convincing. So that was a great start to the project, um, which was around trying to find where the evidence lay that the architects, i good design, had any impact. There's a whole ton of books on architecture. I've written lots of them, and I have to say, virtually none of them have any evidence in there that architecture is of any value in any language that a policymaker or a fund hedge fund manager might be interested in. Um, there's also this stuff. This is the grey literature, or the industry documents, uh, which are constantly being produced by our industry. Um, and what we found is that people have a very, very hard time getting their brains around this stuff. There is good material in here, but actually for a practitioner or somebody in any of your roles to actually spend time trawling through to get evidence, really, really hard. Um, there's also this stuff. This is the refereed journals that academics around here produce. And we did some work with architects in practice, and we discovered that these refereed journals are the source of information that architectural practitioners are least likely to use. They will almost never use this information, even though it's not trying to sell them a Thristlington cubicle, and it is the highest level of cutting level edge research. So they don't use that. What they do is they talk to their mate in the next door table, or they Google it if they need any information. So we've got a real problem of constant reinventing the wheel that people are not building on, on, on uh, innovation that's happening with the industry. Anyway, we decided that the place we would look would be this stuff, the industry literature, which we discovered is, has the very exciting name, grey literature. And there's even a book on grey literature, <laughs> which is suitably grey. It mean, made me go grey. Um, but the, the thing about grey literature, uh, these are reviews of grey literature across different industries. There's no literature review of grey literature in our industry, in the construction industry, 
or housing industry. So um, in a way, this project that we did uh, filled, filled a little bit that gap. So we had a team and we did a, re a review of grey literature, anything pertaining to the value of architects since the year 2000, uh, which is when the RIBA brought out their first sort of value document. Uh, and as you know, New Labour were very hot on the value of design and John Prescott had a very big input into this. And there's a kind of moment when Labour goes and the, and the grey literature sort of starts to dissolve. So these are, these, this is a timeline of, of documents that we read around value in general. And we have a website, you can see it all. I have a 150 page document if you're feeling very masochistic. But some summary points. This is health and well-being. This is a review of the literature we did around that. Um, <coughs> and then we did a review of literature around community cohesion um, to find out if there was any value architect design actually contributed anything in any of that. And we looked at heritage and identity. Um, heritage counts, very interesting, starting to develop a story about <coughs> social value coming through that. So reviewing all of these things, we found, and we went through, we went, we then took what we found through a series of consultations. This is with non-architect academics in this building. This is with industry professionals. There's Nick Rogers from Taylor Wimpy, Andrew Von Brasky, PRP, um, Ellen Warwick from Infinity Sutton, industry professionals. What did they think of the things that we found? Had we left, was there anything we'd missed out? We asked them. We went, we, we uh, and you, you recognize Jim from Great Places in the corner there. We went to the Manchester offices of Colonel Simpatico, which are a marketing team, because we are firmly under the belief that you can produce all the worthy research you like. It's the way you present it. Has to have some artistry to get across. Um, and he's thinking about the branding, the branding of architects as a, as a sort of a breed. Uh, so we're thinking with them. <laughs> and uh, yeah, well, they have their, their, their brand needs some work. Um, and then we also have the Sheffield Live Works, which is our outreach arm of the School of Architecture in a disused shop down in Sheffield. Do go and have a look at it. Uh, advertising for jobs for a new person to, to be the project manager right now. Um, which is where we do kind of community work, and we're the only school of architecture in the UK that does this. So we went and used that for consultation with, uh, these were higher, um, uh, students from higher education colleges. We found very swiftly, you couldn't mention the word architecture, just went nowhere. Um, I don't know if you've read the K People and Places re uh, report, really, really good, about Sheffield. They tried to use beauty as this kind of hook to get people talking about their built environment really worth reading. So we talked with them, we talked with school kids, we, and we developed a kind of toolkit that we're continuing to develop through live works on how to talk about what architects do to uh, people who are not architects. So at the end of the day, we have came up with a series of findings that in all of those documents that we read, architecture is barely ever mentioned. Sometimes they say built environment professional, Sometimes, I mean, even the Farrell report doesn't say architect, it says built environment. Uh, you just don't get, you couldn't say architect achieved this outcome, it just doesn't happen. And very little evidence that design generally makes any, benef uh, any, any difference. Barely any evidence of architect's value. And a real confusion actually about what it is that architects do. Um, I'm sure you, well, you may be familiar with the YouGov survey that says 15% of the public don't even know that architects design buildings. So there, there is a really very serious confusion about the skills of an architect, which we in the school are arguing that an expanded set of services, um, more and more architects are getting into research and participatory active in other things that are not really well known. The word design is problematic. Anyone can do design. Um, design is a word that doesn't travel into Europe for a start, uh, and particularly if we're trying to prove the value of architects, design could be done by anybody or a non-architect or anyone could do it, so it doesn't really help us. And the one, the, perhaps the most important thing we learned, that you need to focus on the process, not the product. There are so many um, attempts, and the RIBA is doing one right at this minute, to get a building and then work back from that building and say that was the value of good design, that was the value of architects. Well actually, as we all know, a good building or any building is a, a, the product of an interdisciplinary team and you absolutely couldn't extrapolate out of it any one, um, the, the input of any particular profession. 
So you really need to focus on the process, what happened along the way to making the building, and then you can extrapolate what the person did, and then you can start to evaluate it. There's also a big confusion about landscape design, planning, urban design. People just don't know what any of these things are. And I think and as those conversations I want to start to have with those professions. So generally, you spend a lot of money, a lot of time doing a review, find that there's almost no evidence for the value of architects. Or, so we, we concluded from this that we must promote architects, the profession, and not architecture, which is something very, very woolly that can be done by anyone. Uh, and I'm sorry that we're very partisan, but we are a school of architecture and we're trying to sell the higher level skills that we are teaching and delivering in our um, establishment. Um, but we need also to focus on this process rather than the built product. What is it that architects contribute to the process? We need a simple definition of the architect's skills. Lo and behold, the RABA doesn't really have any kind of definition, nor does the heads of schools of architecture SCOSA have any real de definition. We have the criteria from the RABA, which I would argue are flawed, and they are under review anyway. <coughs> and once we've got the definition of these skills, we can then start to develop an evidence base of the value of those skills. And I've just been given a, a £250,000 grant to start doing that. That's three or four minutes. Hmm? Three or four minutes. Three or four minutes. OK, so architect types and skills. Not all architects are the same. We've met Sarah today, she is not the same as Norman Foster, the black magic man of architect land, or these are the kind of folk, these are Urbed operating in Liverpool, um, doing participatory architects. So one of the first things we have to really do is draw out the fact that architects are different. And we believe that architects have different value systems, which we have separated into social, cultural, and commercial. One of the reasons that architects look like they're fighting with each other all the time is because they're coming from uh, varied value systems. And the overlap, they're not discrete, but you have to recognize that they're different. And as a client, you need to find the architect with the right value system for you. So we define the skills of all the different architect value systems, five skill sets with each one. I'm just going to look at social architects because I think that's probably the one that's most interest to you folk. We say they create environments to transform the way we feel and think, and I've produced some beautiful examples of Sarah, Sarah's Wigglesworth's Sandal Magna School there, um, which, which is um, you know, widely recognised as a real research <coughs> project setting out to do that. They help people get together in communities. This could be through the way a building is designed, helping people to get together to change where they live. And there's a lovely example of Biker Wall and Ralph Erskine, Prince Philip and his younger incarnation. <coughs> they think about what's special about an area's heritage and character and help to make it more special. Uh, this is the work of um, uh, Fat in Holland. Uh, uh, instead of NIMBY, it's WIMBY, welcome into my backyard, the, the project here, uh, to try and develop the identity of the place. And they help people to design their own homes and neighbourhoods, in this way helping them to feel positive about themselves and when, where they live, and that there's Urbed's um, bakery project. So these are not normally what perhaps people think an architect does. And another one, really importantly, they record through drawings and models what goes on in an area to provide information about what's needed in a place. Uh, and the, the glaring example of that is Jan Gale uh, and his practice in Denmark. It's very clear that the, the Copenhagen, the most livable city, could not have been, as the politicians there say, could not have been made like that without the evidence provided by people like Jan Gale, the evidence provided by architects on the impact of what they achieved. All the evidence cascades towards this one thing. Involving people in the designs of their own homes is good, is good for well-being. That is absolutely unequivocal. And if you, there's a classic book, Mental Health and the Built Environment, you can go to for that. OK, so that's where we got to, and it's ongoing. We're trying to take that research. We're going to look at all the refereed journals and try and make a review that you can read. And we're taking it into Europe as well. Last thing, generating evidence through research. Just This is my, this is my clarion call. 800 billion euros available to address grand societal challenges. Anybody here part of a Horizon 2020 research bid? Right, OK. Well, I've got a pal in Cardiff who's coining it doing this stuff. Uh, and I really think it's something we need to get a part of. And we have to do it together. It's not going to, you know, we have to have industry, we have to have academia, we have to have public bodies, we have to work together. Another, so it's 
absolutely unintelligible words, websites, and there's a skill to doing this, but we universities, we've got the skill. Um, so please, come and do research with us or with another university. There's a book, the grey books at the back are all the kind of research that this department is doing. You might want to find an academic through that, or we can put you by way of academics in other place, because we just want more research to happen across um, between industry and academia. Other source of money, Innovate UK. Quite easy to get Innovate UK money. Uh, anyone had Innovate UK money here? One? Okay, so you're, you're, you're a commercial body. You get a little bit of um, input from the university. If you can prove that you derive, derive some commercial benefit, you can get Innovate UK money. And I made that sound very simplistic, but it, it is possible. It's not rocket science. So these are sources and ways of doing things that are not just about uh, the minimums of operation. There's, this report is at the back there. Um, this is where we were attempting to find out what research was going on in practice in the field of housing. Please have a look at it. It's a little bit outdated now. We did a lot of work. We've done a lot of work trying to facilitate practitioners to do research. And this is really the way we're going. And I just want to shine an example again, Sarah. Spare your blush. Well project. Um, came out of our home research group very swiftly, a lovely collaborative team, a good amount of money, a hell of a lot of work, I know, Sarah, but going to produce something really, really good. So that's um, a very good example of a nice partnership. So um, in conclusion, good architects do impact on well-being, but we also, and we also need to generate evidence on the value of good housing if we're actually going to persuade anybody to pay for it. So really, architects, academia and practice must team up with industry, you, to do research, take advantage of research-based funding streams and to really make UK PLC an innovator in this area. That's it. Thank you.